Even our announcements have become more cautious. We now say an attempted rendezvous in space instead of Gemini 6, 7, a rendezvous in space. It doesn't indicate any lack of confidence, however, in the program on our side. As Chuck Von Fremd uh, said at Cape Kennedy a little earlier this morning, uh, there is a feeling now that this time everything will be all right. After two attempts to get Gemini 6 up, first to rendezvous with an unmanned Agena on October 25th, and then that uh, breathtaking uh, abortion on the pad uh, on Sunday when they already had ignition and then the mission had to be scrubbed. Chuck Van Fremd can give us a, the late word out the Cape as the count stands at T minus three minutes and holding as planned. They hold as planned until launch time of 8.37. Chuck? Walter, everything continues to be absolutely go here. The weather is holding up very, very nicely at this point. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any problem in the worldwide tracking network things going along just beautifully. And uh, Walter, now back to you. And let's check in with uh, Mission Control Center at Houston where our man Nelson Benton standing by. Nelson? Walter, one of the things we were worried about yesterday was that tracking ship near the Philippines, the coastal sentry, whether or not uh, it would work. It had some problems, but the word from Mission Control this morning is that the CSQ is back in operation, so this could mean that if that rendezvous comes off as it should, we may get the word perhaps uh, 10 minutes earlier than we had hoped for, rather than having to wait for the spacecraft uh, to pass over Hawaii. Everything is go at mission control, and we're waiting for the launch. Waller? Nelson, you bring up an interesting point there. The rendezvous should take place over the Indian Ocean at about 2.26 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. If everything is exactly as planned, and it could, uh, there could be quite a bit of change in that actual rendezvous time. But if everything is absolutely as hoped for, it would be 2.26 over the Indian Ocean. Uh, there will not be, or actually over about Indonesia at that point, I think it is. Now, th that means that they will not be in touch with a ground station at the precise moment of of rendezvous, that is, when they get within about 3,000 feet of each other. Uh, th so any report to us of the success of rendezvous will be delayed a few minutes until they pass over the next tracking station. Uh, at about five minutes after rendezvous, they're over Coastal Century Quebec. And now that also depends upon how good communications are. You know how some days you can bring in distant stations on your radio, some days you can't. Well, it's just uh, the same with this highly technical equipment on the tracking stations around the world, uh, this series of stations uh, under the orbits of the uh, astronauts, and uh, exact time when acquisition comes, that is when they are first able to get in touch with the spacecraft, changes. It can change uh, by the minute to the hour of the day. Uh, so we don't know exactly what time we will be hearing from Coastal Century Quebec, and it will be hearing in turn from the astronauts uh, that the rendezvous has been achieved. It should be within four or five minutes, however. Yesterday, Coastal Century Quebec was out for a while, and there was some danger that we weren't going to hear at all for that period of time, that pass, and wouldn't hear until the spacecraft was in touch with Hawaii another five or six minutes later. However, now it looks like we'll get the report around, oh, perhaps 2.30, 3, 34, 35, that rendezvous has been achieved if indeed all goes well. The count, T minus three minutes and holding as planned. The count to be picked up at 34 minutes uh, after the hour for a planned launch at 8.37 a.m. Everything going well, tracking stations reporting in in order, the recovery vessels standing by in the areas where they must be, the astronauts buttoned into the spacecraft, uh, the Titan boosters standing there having been checked out now as ready for launch and the weather is go as well. CBS News color coverage of Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 will continue in a moment. Back here at our CBS News Space Center, this is Walter Cronkite for the report of the launch of Gemini 7 at 8.37 a.m. this morning, just about, uh, what is that, 10, 15, 16, 17 minutes from now. This mission of Gemini 6 and 7 will achieve, it is hoped, the first rendezvous of manned space vehicles. They're already in the flight of Gemini 7 has established the longest flight in space. And this morning, shortly after midnight, the Gemini 7 astronauts, Borman and Lovell, set a new space record. They had been up uh, in space longer than all of the Soviet space flights combined. Also, they've achieved another first, as we reported Sunday. They've, they've flown for the first time in an underwear environment. 
They've flown in their underwear, taking off their new lightweight space suits and proving that uh, that is perfectly feasible and that it is more comfortable for an astronaut. They are getting a little bit weary, it has been indicated, as might be expected, in that uh, cooped up uh, spacecraft of theirs, hardly bigger than the front seat of a compact car they've been living in since a week ago Saturday. They're in their 11th day now, nearing their 12th day. And they say that they're feeling a little bit crummy. They notice that the days are getting a little bit longer than they were before. G7 splashdown is now scheduled for about 2.30 in the afternoon, or rather 8.30 in the morning on Saturday. Uh, the splashdown of Gemini 6, if it gets off on schedule this morning and achieves its rendezvous today, will come about the same time tomorrow morning. The rendezvous should come at around 2.30. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be reporting that uh, fully as we get the reports from the uh, spacecraft. They'll be meeting at some 17,500 miles an hour as they whirl around the space, although, of course, their relative speed will be down to about a third of a mile an hour as they close in that last 1,000 feet. The rendezvous comes at about 185 mile height over the Mariana Islands in the western Pacific. Uh, the where they will fly in formation for uh, around four to five hours with uh, intricate maneuvers in plane and out of plane, that is in orbit and out of orbit uh, as the Gemini 6 maneuvers around the Gemini 7. This is a picture from our uh, television cameras aboard the WASP, and here's Dallas Townsend. This is Dallas Townsend aboard the aircraft carrier WASP. It's a fine, bright morning out here in the Atlantic, and the WASP is on station about 1,120 nautical miles east of Cape Kennedy. We're ready to do double duty to recover GT-6 if it's launched and has to be aborted in the first few minutes of flight, and also to recover GT-7 if necessary. Up here on the flight deck a few minutes ago, we watched the launching of the planes heading for their recovery stations to the north. Bernard Eisman, suppose you take it from there. Dallas, just 45 minutes before scheduled launch time, the first helicopter, number 51. That's the primary search helicopter, left the WASP's flight deck, headed for station 124 miles north of this ship. Within seconds after the departure of 51, number 56, the prime swim helicopter, and then the relay aircraft, the one who will provide on-scene communication back to the Cape and back to the spacecraft. Number 56 carrying the team of swimmers who will go into the water and attach the flotation collar. Dallas, the last plane to leave was the air boss, the on-scene commander, and you saw him go. Yes, indeed. He's being launched right now from the port hydraulic catapult. There he is in plane number zero, the air boss, Commander David Barksdale, who's commander of Air Group 51. He will be the on-scene commander, and he was leaving the flight, flight deck now, heading for station 120 miles to the north. He will be the on-scene commander. The flight deck, four levels below us, is fairly quiet now, but it will be anything but quiet when the time comes for recovery, because that's where chances are the astronauts will first set foot on the carrier. Bernie Eisman, you'll have a close-up look at that event. Obviously, the ideal way to bring in the astronauts is in their spacecraft, but in the event that doesn't happen, as it's unusual that it will, they'll come aboard in the helicopter, and they'll be deposited on deck just at about this point. Dallas, you'll be the first to see them coming aboard uh, in the helicopter when that helicopter is still quite a way out. Yes, indeed, Bernie. Uh, Swim 1, the prime recovery helicopter, will approach the carrier from the west off the port bow. We'll probably see it coming in fairly rapidly, and then it will slow down and come in over the forward flight deck, and it will settle down on the deck at the position known as spot four, as just about on the line with the forward part of the carrier's island. After the rotors have stopped, the astronauts will get out and walk aft a few yards. They'll be escorted by Don Sulkin, head of the NASA recovery team on board. At one end of a red carpet run out from the superstructure, they'll be greeted by Vice Admiral Charles Weekly, commander of anti-submarine warfare forces of the Atlantic Fleet, and Rear Admiral William Leonard, commander of the Western Atlantic Recovery Forces. They'll also be greeted by Captain Gordon Hartley, the skipper of the WASP. Bernie Eisman, pick up the story there. From that point, Dallas, they'll head from the flight deck through the Marine Honor Guard with the Navy ship's band playing and down to the hatchway the hatchway that takes them to the flight deck elevator, escalator rather, down through that door, 
to the escalator and down to the hangar bay on their way to sick bay. And that's where you'll be able to pick them up again. Uh, yes, uh, Bernie, uh, when they get onto the hangar deck, they will cross it going diagonally from starboard to port over to the hatch and the ladder leading to sick bay. They'll cross at just about this point amidships. Sick bay is one level below the hangar deck. I hear nothing. And there, Dr. Howard Minners and other members of the NASA medical team will conduct the physical examination. It will take about four and a half hours, and it will not be very extensive in the case of Shira and Starbird. Back to Bernie Eisman. After that long time in sick bay, because that is their primary destination aboard this ship, they'll stay about 24 hours, no more, hopefully, and then from this flight deck, they'll depart again back to the Cape and Houston. This is Bernard Eisman aboard the carrier Wasp. Those are remarkably good pictures from the uh, WASP. They're being uh, relayed to us by early bird satellite. The first time we'll have an opportunity uh, to see the astronauts return to the deck of the carrier. In covering Project Gemini and Mercury for that matter, we've been able to show you just about every aspect of the flight except the re-entry and the recovery, hundreds of miles at sea. Well, this time, if all goes well, we'll show you live the astronauts coming back onto the deck of the carrier. Getting that picture back is indeed a mammoth operation, and pool reporter Bernie Eisman has that story. This veteran aircraft carrier, prime recovery ship for the flights of Gemini 6 and 7, is a seaborne television station and transmitter. We're equipped to send live, minute by minute, as it's happening, the recovery of both teams of astronauts. Half a hundred television engineers and technicians and almost 100 tons of equipment are aboard. With cameras strategically placed all over the ship, we hope to be able, for the first time, to see recovery as it happens. Here's how we hope it'll work. The cameras and microphones on board transmit the picture and sound to this mobile unit parked on the WASP's hangar deck. From there, the signal goes to an IT&T unit right alongside. IT&T then feeds the report through this giant 30-foot high transmitting dish that will send the signal 22,300 miles high into space, aiming at the tiny 85-pound early bird satellite up there in fixed orbit. When the signal is received and translated by early bird, the program is relayed to the receiving station at Andover, Maine, where it's fed to the television networks. The time involved from ship to TV screen in your home, milliseconds. The cost of rigging the WASP this way, some $300,000. The cost of using the satellite, some $22,000 an hour. But if we can report to you directly, as it happens, the recovery, if we can succeed, the flights of Gemini 6 and 7 will also be history-making events in television journalism. Bernard Eisman aboard the USS Wasp. And the uh, scheduled launch of Gemini 6 is now just 10 minutes away. Uh, the count is T minus three minutes and holding as planned, uh, running down toward the last two minutes of the planned 25 minute hold. A hold which uh, actually has so far not proved necessary, a hold that was built into the countdown procedure in case anything had gone wrong, so there'd be uh, plenty of time to make adjustments, it would be hoped, uh, before the, that precise and critical second when uh, Gemini 6 has to get off. These launchings for rendezvous have to be a lot more precise than a launching for a simple orbital flight. Uh, since uh, the launch must come at the precise uh, second in time when uh, the Earth, Cape Kennedy, the precise point, is in the position below the present orbit of Gemini 7, uh, so that with a minimum expenditure of fuel, a minim minimum change in uh, the orbital plane, Gemini 6 can get in the same path as uh, Gemini 7 for what it is expected to be, would be, would, uh, will be a 103,000 mile chase through space through three and a half orbits until on the fourth orbit over the Marianas in the Western Pacific, rendezvous is accomplished.